International Colloquium of Mexican and New Zealander Studies, Trans-Pacific Encounters Between the Past and the Multipolar World, an academic dialogue. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation to moderate this panel, which is quite relevant among the international community. For those of you who don't know, UNAM is the institution in Mexico in charge of monitoring the volcanoes nationwide through the National Seismological Service. As a member of the international team of UNAM, serving as Associate Director of the Center for Mexican Studies in Boston, Massachusetts, I celebrate this colloquium, which will enable the audience to learn from scholars at Massey University, UNAM, and beyond, who will be interacting with each other, sharing their researches, and building bridges in the knowledge volcanoes literally across the ocean. Let Seismological us hope Center. that the conversation during the panels of this colloquium will involve evolve into further joint academic initiatives in the benefit of scholars, students, and the society of our peoples. Let me now introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mark Bevington. He received a Bachelor in Geophysics and a Master's in Probability Theory from the Victoria University of Wellington, followed by a PhD in Applied Probability from the University of Cambridge. After a postdoc at the University of Queensland, he took up a lectureship in Stochastic Operations Research at Massey University, where he is now Professor of Geostatistics. Originally a statistical seismologist, Mark gravitated to volcanology on finding collaborators at Massey. He has focused on developing new probabilistic models for volcanic hazard forecasting, while continually attempting to lessen his ignorance of things volcanological. A past chair of IABCEI, Commission on Statistics in Volcanology, Mark has published 130 referred papers, about half of them in volcanology and seismology, and the rest in other areas of probability in statistics. Dr. Bevington, I remind you that you have 15 minutes to deliver your presentation, and I kindly request that you stick to that time so we can finish the panel as scheduled. The floor is yours, please. Now, I'll share my screen and uh, hopefully keep to time. Can everyone see my slides now? Okay. Uh, this is uh, basically joint work um, from uh, a, a student, Taishan Ang, who um, was the University of Singapore, Nish, uh, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore, and came out to, to New Zealand to do a um, internship. And this is the work that was done then. Right, so our problem here is Auckland, um, big uh, urban uh, centre as far as New Zealand goes. Uh, I suspect the Mexicans would regard one and a half million population as somewhat uh, <laughs> minor, but it's growing, um, driven by, I think, all the yachting. I believe there's some sort of boat race on there today. Uh, unfortunately, we've built it on a volcanic field, an active volcanic field, which has erupted about 50 times in the last 250,000 years, and most recently about 600 odd years ago. So we're expecting one in the next few thousand years, which is not particularly uh, precise, but the problem comes down to more where, how much, and what the eruption will produce. Because um, Auckland is so low lying with water saturated sediments, the initial phase is likely to be a very big bang, followed by a surge to a several kilometres distance, which is going to be uh, fairly fatal and very damaging. Uh, on the other hand, because it's a basaltic um, volcanic field, not likely to have huge eruption clouds. Uh, any volcanic ash will be locally uh, confined. And it's quite likely that we'll have uh, scoria cones, ballistics, and lava flows. So there's a lot going on here. I'll just draw your attention to certain critical infrastructure. There's Auckland Airport, uh, which is basically the main international airport in New Zealand. Uh, there's the Auckland Harbour Bridge, which forms the main link to north of Auckland. And as far as Auckland goes, there is also the wastewater treatment plant in there, uh, which, of which there's only one to service one and a half million inhabitants. Right, um, because um, there's such a risk to New Zealand, um, the Auckland volcanic field was the focus of one of the two um, 
one of the three now national civil defence exercises. This one was Exercise Ruamoko. Ruamoko is the uh, Maori um, god or spirit of uh, volcanoes, among other things. Uh, this was an, a uh, civil defence exercise, and the idea here is to test the systems, allow people to um, try their role out, identify um, problems, etc. So it's very important that it contains a narrative. So there is only one specific scenario goes on, but there is a narrative and it goes over time. So we have the pre-eruption pre phase, people try to uh, call an, an evacuation and then try to um, deal with the um, simulated uh, results of an eruption. So we see here, here's an example of um, pre-eruptive seismicity. Uh, which is fairly clear, clearly indicating that um, the likely event is in this sort of area. And there's an artist's impression of what the initial phase would have looked like. And this is basically the, the zone in which we expect you know, pretty catastrophic damage. You see it covers the uh, treatment, wastewater treatment ponds uh, there. All right, the, other, the alternative from scenarios is probabilistic forecasting. And this basically deals with when, uh, where, um, how much, and what sort of damage you might see. Problem with this is that it's essentially static. We just basically have a number of this, and it doesn't say whereabouts in the eruption sequence that occurred, what happened prior to the eruption, um, and it basically includes an infinity of possibilities, if you like. So we have two approaches here. We've got strengths and weaknesses of both, probabilistic. We quantify the entire range of possibilities and likelihoods. On the other hand, it's extremely high dimensional and very difficult to communicate to anyone. It has a complete range of hazard magnitudes. That's a plus and a minus. Uh, yes, we include it, but we don't know which it is. And so simulating it is very, very difficult. Scenarios. Only one or maybe a few specific possibilities. The likelihood of it is not quantified. So you might have a scenario and it may be a one in a billion possibility. It's built around a narrative and so it's easily communicated. So this work was to look at can we create a hybrid approach by calculating the likelihoods in a suite of scenarios? So this was previous work. This is where we started from. There was a paper here that created a set of eight scenarios for the Auckland volcanic field to basically look at different possibilities. And the focus was on possible impacts. And you can see they were driven by uh, location, basically. This one was near Auckland Airport. Um, this one, high density of critical infrastructure. Um, proximity to Auckland Harbour Bridge, proximity to Waitamata Port operations. Uh, these were all very, very important things and hence they worked out we're going to have scenarios in these points and then there was a big uh, meeting where we basically discussed what the likely um, sequence of events would be at each of those points. And that then would produce these. We have here, these are the ash clouds that occur over time, the tephra blanket. So you can see uh, we've got pretty low-lying winds, mainly from the west is the prevailing low-level low winds. And these are the proximal hazards. We've got the base surge. We have the lava, um, crater, or edifice. Basically, if you get a crater or a, a small volcano sitting on something, we assume it's pretty much destroyed. Very much the same for lava. Uh, if it um, hits, for example, housing, likely to destroy it. Most of um, the houses in, in Auckland, or most of the houses in New Zealand actually are of wooden construction, and so lava is fairly um, destructive. Right, now the main distinction between these um, eruption styles is they're either wet with the addition of water, or they're dry. The wet one's the phreatomagmatic. The water interacts with the magma, and basically we get louder bangs, smaller particles, uh, bigger holes. On the dry ones, there's no water involved, so what comes out is usually lava 
or scoria. It doesn't go as far. It's much larger. So this was a very important distinction. And so we can work on the basis of that as our initial, um, this, our initial classification of the eruptions. So we looked at the uh, scenarios and all, the all scenario A was purely free magmatic, no change in style to magmatic. Uh, scenarios B, C and um, oh, sorry, uh, B, ah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Scenarios B, um, B, F, and H uh, initially start with freado magmatic. So we have a large crater, a tough ring, but then transition to a magmatic style with, for example, a scoria cone uh, growing within the tough ring. Other ones, for example, the Water Matter Report started as a purely magmatic scenario and then becomes freatomagmatic with the addition of water later on. There's also a Sertzian style. That's when an eruption occurs in relatively deep water and the eruption column can't push the water out of the way. And so you get basically a cone growing underwater until it breaks free of the surface and then it transitions to something more magmatic. So these were important uh, distinctions. So we then worked out a probability tree. We started with uh, whether we started on land or on water, then on the basis of the initial phase, and then whether it made a phase transition. And we were able to uh, categorize the uh, scenarios using this, although we had to add an additional scenario they hadn't thought of, which was a purely freatomagmatic offshore eruption that wasn't actually in the suite of eruptions. Okay. Put this one in just to remind myself occasionally that I'm a mathematician at heart. Uh, so there's a lot of equations there. But basically, this was to work out the probability of making the transition based on the environmental variables. And so it includes things like the altitude. It's very important because of the low-lying nature of Auckland and the thickness of water-associated so sediments, particularly down here in the Manukau lowlands, there's tens of metres of water-saturated you know, uh, sediment there. And then there's the rock structure. Uh, the northern side is much harder rock than the southern side. And uh, there's also the age to account for uh, environmental variables. Over the history of the field, the, the uh, sea level has increased quite a bit. And so areas that were uh, above water are now below water. And additionally, uh, we went for simple. We suppose that the magmatic eruption will become freatomagmatic if the vent expands and intersects a large body of water, you know, like the harbour or a major river, effectively. And as we have several freatomagmatic magmatic uh, eruptions, we weighted those by the volume of the um, thing. So, Results. These are the initial freatomagmatic phases. So we have a freatomagmatic um, scenario, which doesn't become magmatic. And this is the probability that that occurs. And we can see basically that's pretty much limited to an area down there, very close to the airport. And the proposed scenario uh, location dead centered it. So we're very happy about that. The Freata magmatic to magmatic scenarios, um, less happy. Uh, you can see they're quite likely in the rest of the southern Auckland. So that scenario was good. Uh, these ones are definitely miscast in the wrong place. They're not likely to be initially Freata magmatic up there. Initially magmatic scenarios, um, almost certainly in the centre of the city. So good there. Uh, the magmatic to freight are magmatic, as you can see, it's basically limited to the margins of the uh, coast. So again, in the correct place. And finally, the ones that start in the water, uh, freight are magmatic becoming magmatic. There was the scenario. Good. Uh, we're not showing the uh, scenario Z there. And this one was Sertzian. And we slightly missed there. The ch shipping channel isn't quite deep enough to really 
uh, be sure of a search engine scenario there, but we weren't bad. Okay, so what do we do with this? Uh, a lot of things, but main. But I'll give an example here of insurance. Um, the New Zealand has an earthquake commission, which basically um, insures against natural disasters uh, beyond a certain um, amount householders have to pay. So they're very interested in knowing what the potential bill from an Auckland eruption could be. So for this case, what we do is we input the hazard. That's what we've just been looking at. Uh, we then have the exposed elements. And this is the housing stock in Auckland. As you can see, we have rather more than half a million things that the Earthquake Commission are interested in, in purple. And we combine those via the vulnerability, which I'm not going to go into, but involved uh, students at, at University of Canterbury uh, firing rocks at um, model uh, roof elements, for example, and seeing what damage eventuated. And it's quite complicated in these scenarios because you get one hazard and then another. So, for example, if the roof caves in due to ballistics landing on them, uh, then Tefra will enter the house and basically ruin it. And um, there are various other combinations. So this was the focus of another PhD that was just completed. So, for example, let's look at vault scenario D. So this one basically was figured to go with an unrest phase and then an initial minor explosive eruption. It's what we call Hawaiian style, with lots of jetting of lava and the like. Uh, ash fall from this as it um, disperses through the atmosphere. We then go to a minor explosive phase, which is more like uh, Stromboli in Italy. And then basically just a long, long period of lava flows, very much like we have at Kilauea in Hawaii. So looking at this, we can overlay the ash fall, for example, on the uh, building locations. We can overlay the lava flow and various other things. I'm not showing the ballistics, which is basically a, a circular zone around the vent or things like that. And what we can do is we can work out the probability that each building is in one of a number of damage states. So damage state zero means it's fine, no problem. Damage state five means totally destroyed. And basically a continuum through those. And we can total that up for how much damage in terms of rebuild costs. So as we can see, uh, almost all the damage comes from ash fall because that affects so much more. Well, in this case, it affects all of Auckland. And so um, yeah, much of the housing stock of Auckland suffers some damage. The lava flow is the next most because everything touched by the lava flow here, because it's in a residential area with basically um, mainly wooden construction is destroyed. Uh, there'll be considerable amounts of fire as well as the um, physical force of the lava flow. Give me this left, please. So summing this up, and you can do this for all the other events, and looking at um, this D was controlled to be low. Scenario E came up with $60 billion in damage, which for new, well, that's somewhat more than New Zealand GDP, I think, which is a bit awkward. And this looks at um, the percentage of buildings destroyed. So D, basically, this, this is about two thirds of the housing stock in Auckland. That's a massive, massive rebuild project. Uh, we didn't have enough builders to recover from the Christchurch earthquake. Um, trying to rebuild two thirds of Auckland doesn't bear thinking about. So to sum up, what we've done here is we've got models for where the eruption is going to be. We've just looked at models for what the eruption will be. Problem with what we've done there is we've looked at the effects at the one location. So what we're doing now is we're looking at a way to probabilistically run all those scenarios at different locations across a grid to get a better idea of what the average uh, damage from an eruption might be and what the limits are. So to do that, we've got to simulate hazards on the location grid. Pretty easy with ash. We just shift everything. Uh, no problem there. Flow hazards are more difficult because they rely on the terrain. 
lava likes to flow downhill. So we're going to have to work out a very smart computational scheme to do that. And hopefully, um, because we're doing a probabilistic distribution across locations, the fact that we're limited to a, a small number of scenarios shouldn't be too much of a bias. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bevington, for your exciting le lecture. Uh, I'm sure we will have some minutes at the end to interact with the, with the audience during the Q&A session. Now, please let me introduce our second speaker of today, Dr. Hugo Delgado. Dr. Delgado holds a PhD and a Master's in Science Geology by the Faculty of Science of Tohoku University in Japan and a Bachelor's Degree in Geological Engineering by the Faculty of Engineering of UNAM. He's founding president of the Latin American Association of Volcanology and vice president of the International Association of Volcanology and Chemistry of the Earth's Interior. Associate director of international magazines like Bulletin of Volcanology and Geoscience Data Journal, the funding of laboratories such as the University Laboratory of Petrology and Infrastructure Development, such as instrumental monitoring networks at Popocatépetl and Fuego de Colima volcanoes are essential part of the innovative work with scientific and social impact. He is advisor and trainer in courses of evaluation of geological hazard in Central and South America, teaching the general volcanology course, which is taught online since 2011 for several countries in Latin America, as well as governmental entities in Mexico and Latin America, such as Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Chile. Dr. Delgado, I remind you that you have 15 minutes to deliver your presentation, and I kindly request that you can stick to the time so we can finish the plan schedule. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today to everybody. So, Let's uh, see. I just wanted to talk about the uh, uh, about some studies on natural hazards in Mexico, and the natural hazards in Mexico are very wide. There are uh, many. Uh, some of them are atmospheric, like the hurricanes and uh, fires, but uh, I'm going to be concentrated in uh, the hazards that are related to geodynamic processes. But the most uh, important thing that I would like to stress now is how in Mexico we are carrying out a basic science that immediately transforms into applied science and immediately into uh, decisions made by the authorities because we have found a very interesting way to coexist together uh, scientists and authorities in order to uh, work together for the benefit of both uh, of both sides. So uh, Mexico is a country with a complex geodynamic setting like New Zealand. We are also in the ring of fire. And the, it's important to notice that uh, the Mexican territory comprises uh, three, uh, five uh, tectonic plates. We are in, a, we have in Mexico the interaction of a continental uh, plate like uh, North American plate, but we are also having interaction with the Rivera plate, the Pacific plate, Cocos plate, and also the Caribbean plate. So this uh, makes a, a very special uh, situation for the seismicity to occur all along the, the, the country. But at the same time, also, we have a lot of volcanoes that are uh, active in, in, in Mexico. So uh, how uh, we are dealing with, uh, at least with the seismicity and volcanism in Mexico. I will give some uh, examples of the basic science, uh, how this converts immediately into applied science. For instance, this is a, a, a research project that uh, has to be with the seismicity uh, offshore uh, Mexico. Traditionally, uh, we set uh, instruments on, on land, but now uh, we have a different scope having uh, the instrumentation uh, on uh, the seafloor offshore. And 
also uh, planting instruments on both sides of the uh, from the trench. So in this way, we hope that uh, with this new knowledge, having the uh, information from the, the from from the continent and also from the sea, we can better assess the the, the way the earthquakes are uh, being produced. And we would be uh, very happy if we, with this uh, information, with this new data, uh, we can uh, forecast uh, some of the earthquakes that might uh, affect the, the population. But interestingly, this uh, basic science uh, information uh, is being applied to uh, teach the students, particularly the children, about how all this new instrumentation is being planted in the bottom of the sea and for them to be prepared, better prepared for the uh, any, any uh, occurrence in the future of all these uh, phenomena. Another example of this basic science that transforms into applied science is in, in volcanology. We have been uh, developing new instrumentation in order to set these instruments uh, on, 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 the, on the slopes of the volcanoes because we, uh, in difference with, for instance, the meteorological uh, uh, phenomena, uh, we here, we cannot see, uh, in, in the case of the meteorological uh, phenomena, uh, there are satellites observing the Earth and also there are instrumentations on, on land. And so the, the phenomena that is occurring in the middle can be better assessed, but we have to see what the volcano is doing with uh, inferences from uh, instruments that are set uh, uh, on, 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 on the surroundings of the volcano, but we cannot see inside the volcano. So it is important to develop all these uh, uh, new instruments and not, not only the instruments, but also to uh, develop new ways to process the data and also new ways to uh, identify the processes associated with this, all these new patterns that we are discovering with the new instrumentation. I, I want to talk about uh, some other lines of information <clears throat> that may produce uh, some other uh, lines of, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, to, to, to see the volcanic activity and also to make a forecast of what the volcano is doing. This is a, an old example, some ways. We made uh, all this table with all the activity that was occurring since the 14th century in, in at Popocatépetl volcano and up to 1927. And with this, we uh, produced a, a table and mainly we were uh, establishing distribution functions uh, of this with a very old model. Uh, of course, Mark uh, should uh, remember Wickman's uh, models. And uh, with uh, the repose period data, we constructed a table. And in 1987, we forecasted that a, a, a Popocatépetl volcano with uh, some uh, with a high confidence level, uh, the volcano will have an eruption in, in the year 1997. If we think in 1987 uh, about this activity, we were only three, year, uh, three, three years in difference from the beginning of the current eruption in 1994. So this, this uh, kind of approaches also can, can be very useful for the authorities to prevent whatever uh, the, the volcanic activity could be in the future. So uh, with using also this uh, eruptive history of uh, Popocatépetl volcano, we can recognize the uh, nine, uh, 1663 and 1664 eruption, which was an eruption, uh, a volcanic eruption, which uh, during the activity, glasses of the windows were destroyed, the doors were collapsed, and also fences were collapsed in, in places as far as Puebla City. We are talking about a, a, a city uh, 25 kilometers from, from, from the volcano. So we tried to study uh, the deposits associated with this uh, uh, activity in uh, which we recognized uh, these black ashes related to this eruption. We mapped uh, all this uh, information around the, the, the volcano and we reconstructed 
uh, this kind of eruption. And we discovered that actually before that one, there were two other uh, eruptions very similar in different, in different years. Uh, uh, and uh, with all this information, <clears throat> which is a uh, basic science, we produce uh, a series of simulations in order to know what uh, might happen if one eruption like the like the 17th century eruption will occur in the area <clears throat> in nowadays. So we uh, portray this, uh, all these simulations of what will happen with these kind of eruptions at the volcano uh, nowadays, and we portray it on, on, on a map. And all this uh, uh, orange color uh, is related to the distribution of ashes that might be related to an eruption that might happen uh, similar to the 17th century, which, uh, as you can see, could affect uh, nowadays very populated areas around the, around the volcano. And also about the Laharic uh, flows, we have been studying uh, the, the, the Lahars that have been produced and have been uh, uh, flowing down, down the slope of Popocatépetl volcano uh, uh, all, all along the course in order to see what might be the effects of this kind of uh, 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 processes if they would occur uh, nowadays in the surroundings of the volcano. So uh, for this, we had to use a different approach. Of course, this is a very different thing from uh, uh, dealing with ashes, uh, ash fall. And in this case, the Lajars, we uh, use it, uh, uh, the approach of the euler cauchy law of motion, but also combined with the Navier-Stokes uh, uh, based models in order to uh, have simulations of how, on how this kind of flows might uh, uh, behave when they occur at the slopes of the Popocatépetl volcano. And also, we took into, into account uh, the, the information about the failure of the materials uh, according to different levels of uh, dy dynamic pressure. So we now know uh, with this all this information how the, 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 the different constructions might behave uh, according to the different simulations. And we made uh, 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 a, a series of visits of, for instance, in this case, Chalicintla, uh, Santiago Chalicintla town, in order to recognize the kind of buildings that were uh, constructed all around the, 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 the place. And we made a, an inventory of all the buildings and we portrayed uh, which could be the, the, the situation of every building according to the, the, uh, the, their behavior, uh, according to the uh, construction of every, uh, every construction and how they might uh, behave according to the uh, dynamic pressure in case of laharic flows may enter the, 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 the city. So we made a probability of destruction with a dynamic pressure of 10 kilopascals and we, had, we, we recognized the, 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 the buildings that might be destroyed <clears throat> in case of uh, uh, a laharic flow that might uh, produce this kind of dynamic pressure <clears throat> uh, effects on the, on, the, on the buildings. And also uh, to a larger uh, laharic flow of 20 kilopascals, and recognize it, which might be the, the, the places where the housing uh, might be uh, severely affected by these kind of uh, uh, processes. We had the opportunity to talk to uh, uh, some uh, authorities in Mexico City who saw our results in, 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 in terms of volcanoes. So they made us a challenge and they said, we have a problem of uh, rock falls in outside uh, Northern Mexico City. So uh, we went to see uh, particularly this place where there was a, a kindergarten, a primary school and a secondary school. And we also made the same uh, kind of study, trying to make some simulations and establish uh, hazards mapping and also risk maps in order to uh, portray which might be the best way to protect the population. Together with civil engineers, we proposed several solutions 
And to our surprise, uh, the people, uh, the, the authorities constructed the protections we uh, suggested. And uh, for uh, some events like the September 9, 2003 event, with several rock falls, we uh, saw that uh, this was of very much benefit for the population because the rocks didn't uh, get into the in, into the, into the houses or in, in in this case into the schools. More recent uh, examples, uh, I can talk about a, a, a series of events that are occurring right now in in southern southeastern Mexico. Uh, there have been several earthquakes uh, that are being produced in, 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 in Chiapas, very close to uh, Chiapas, uh, El Chichon Volcano. And in this case, there, there is a problem uh, because uh, the signals are not very well constrained to, to see if they are related to tectonic processes or they are related to the volcano. So. We, uh, ha we are trying to do a lot of research on this in order to have a, a better assessment. And of course, uh, in, in the case of uh, Popocatépetl volcano, we are observing the volcano uh, every day and putting together all the information about the, the seismicity, the, the emissions of gases and different types of, of, of seismicity in order to assess the authorities in order to have a better way to get to uh, good decisions. So th the study of natural hazards in Mexico includes the study of deep source uh, phenomena uh, like uh, um, volcanism and seismicity. Most studies are uh, basic science research, but the results are so important for the society that they are immediately applied to make decisions. Other research starts uh, as a way to understand phenomena that affects the population and due to the importance becomes into scientific research. It is a, a, a way we are playing uh, with these uh, kind of things. And some other studies are applied science for finding best solutions for everyday problems. In Mexico, authorities have understood that coupling uh, basic science to the disaster prevention processes is, a, is the key to save lives and also to save money. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Delgado, for your presentation. Now we have uh, a few minutes to take some questions for, from the audience. So if you agree, I will read uh, two questions uh, in a row. You can answer them. And if we have more time, I will uh, raise another round of questions. First question is, how does the volcanic eruptions uh, prevention system works in New Zealand in order to prevent human losses? Do they have an, any alarm system to prevent the people near the volcanoes? Another question, uh, in New Zealand, do they have uh, programs or plans for the people about what to do when uh, there, is, there is a volcanic eruption or any disaster? And, uh, Someone says it's very interesting to learn more about recent technologies and volcano research in both, con both countries. And the question is, are there current technological exchanges or shared uh, research program between New Zealand and Mexico related to volcano studies and disaster management? So I will leave these two questions and then we can uh, raise uh, some more. Okay, can I answer the second question first? Um, yes, the New Zealand Civil Defence which is now the Ministry of Civil Defence and Emergency Management, has got a very successful program with um, basic instructions of what to do in the event of a whole a range of natural disasters. Um, so, uh, for example, having um, kits on hand, um, um, meeting, arranging meeting places, um, you know, what to do in the event of a, an earthquake, drop, cover, hold, et cetera. So there's a very, very good, um, simple um, set of instructions. The first question is a very sore point in New Zealand because of White Island, for example, um, where 50, uh, 40 odd people died. Uh, the management of volcanoes in New Zealand depends on the volcano. There's no uniform um, procedure. So... Most of our cone volcanoes are in national parks, and so the management of 
those uh, with the Department of Conservation. So they will take advice from scientists and then they make a decision to exclude people from the vicinity of the volcano. Auckland is an urban area. Um, any eruption is likely to be at a new location and so there's no actual codified um, procedure there. And White Island is actually privately owned and so there's uh, a massive a series of court cases going on at the moment to sort out who is responsible. So I can't say any more about that at this stage. I think Hugo would probably know more about New Zealand, um, Mexico exchanges than I would. Yeah, if I can take a word on, on, on this issue. I should uh, mention that, uh, of course, there, there, there is a, a strong uh, relationship with our colleagues in, in New Zealand. Uh, I mean, in, in, in not, uh, well, as, as academic scientists. Uh, I, I was invited by Jan Lindsay a few years ago to actually uh, carry out some field work on the Auckland volcanic field in order to test uh, different way to assess how the activity might be in in, in the Auckland volcanic field, and uh, we we were very happy collaborating together. And I know my my colleague Klaus Ibe uh, works uh, very closely with Shane Cronin, but uh, perhaps this opportunity uh, could be a, a nice uh, a way to start, restart our collaborations and have a, a, a much closer. A relationship. Uh, I, I think uh, we have very, very, very good friends uh, at both sides. So uh, this this should be uh, taken into account for a future collaboration. Very well. I have three more questions from from the house audience. Uh, the first one: Is Mexico prepared an institutional organi organizational level to prevent? or face the consequences of natural disasters are institutions like uh, SINAPROC or Fonden that were born as consequence of disaster of the late 20th century, are they still useful or is it uh, necessary to reformulate them? The second question would be, uh, do, do you see different patterns emerging in terms of volcano activity that could be linked to climate change, uh, rising temperature, for example? And the last question, uh, to what extent and in which forms do scholars take part in the drafting of public policies in Mexico and New Zealand regarding natural disasters such as volcanic eruptions or earthquakes, mm -hmm. uh, and how to transfer these researches from scholars to the agendas of the decision-making people in the governments in the benefit of the communities? Okay. Um, the, the, the question about the, how Sinaproc is, is working. Sinaproc uh, uh, is the Sistema Nacional de Protección Civil, the, the, the National System for Civil Defense. So this is an institutional uh, framework which uh, has been working uh, quite well because uh, it, it, it's a federal view. I mean, uh, it's uh, nationwide. Uh, and uh, in this uh, system, every state gets together uh, and assembles according to the different uh, phenomena that they, or the processes that they have to face with. In uh, the case of the, the, the uh, SINAPROC and the institutions like UNAM, it is, uh, we, we have uh, found a very interesting way to collaborate. Uh, in, of course, uh, always the, the budgets are very limited in, in, in both sides for, for us in the, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the university. We have uh, some uh, limitations on pre, uh, budget for, for instrumentation. And uh, on the side of the government, they have uh, particularly some, some bu bureaucratic uh, problems to hire scientists in the, in, in the system. So how we deal with this? The scientists at UNAM work together with authorities and the authorities 
try to provide uh, some uh, uh, resources for the instrumentation. So we get data for carrying out basic science and the results are communicated immediately to the authorities for them to make the, the, their own decision. So this is a, a, a very uh, nice way in, in which scientists get benefited with data, but also at the same time, the authorities don't have to hire scientists for them to uh, work on, uh, on on this kind of uh, uh, things. And um, about the, 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 the climate change, uh, we uh, uh, published, uh, I don't remember if it was last year or two years ago, we published a, a, a paper on, on where we were uh, trying to assess uh, for all Latin America about the uh, the, the, the influence of the disappearance of glaciers on top of volcanoes and the possibility to, to get uh, with this on load, the, uh, the possibility to have uh, a larger number of eruptions. The, the, the information we got from, from all this uh, data is that uh, there could be this possibility, but uh, 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 it's not completely con conclusive. So. Uh, the, the, the question is still on, on, on the air, and we need to, to, to work a little bit more in order to assess this kind of, of changes. But perhaps one of the, 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 the places where there might be an influence of the, of the climate change is on the volcanic islands, because they are getting a different load from, 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 from the sea level. So these changes uh, could be a, a, a way to to see if there is an, an influence or not. But uh, we are still working on, on it. Uh, and I think uh, it is a, a, a still a matter to be uh, understood there. Uh, perhaps Mark can, can say much more. Yes, yeah, so we've done a bit of uh, research on um, cores going back um, tens of thousands of years. And we noticed there seems to have been a flare up in activity uh, following the last glacial maximum. Which is far more, um, far more of a weight of ice than uh, Hugo is referring to. But the main thing we're sure about with climate change is that the effects of eruptions will occur. There may not be more eruptions, but for example, with the disappearance of glaciers, we may have fewer lahars. Um, but for example, in Auckland, with the rise in sea level, we're likely to have more freato magmatic explosions. So it's mainly how the volcano, volcanic eruptions present themselves, which uh, it seems to be climate affected at this stage. Uh, question three, if I can just answer from the New Zealand viewpoint. Um, there's two things. Uh, there is a New Zealand Volcanic Science Advisory Panel was established a few years ago, which includes experts from government, science and the universities. And that's a subcommittee of the um, Ministry of Civil Defence and Emergency Management. And we usually meet about twice a year to discuss various volcanic related elements and respond to questions coming down from higher levels in government. And on the other side, uh, our research environment in New Zealand is very much pushed at achieving impact uh, rather than purely basic research. We have to deliver to stakeholders. And at the moment, there are about three or four very large volcano projects going on where we have to engage with, um, for example, government, um, Maori and um, community stakeholders and show them what the benefit of the science is to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one last uh, minute message uh, from you to close the, the panel. So, Dr. Uh, Delgado, if you have a last uh, comment, one minute. Yes, uh, well, uh, volcanoes are always uh, uh, very interesting and the, the, the science is, is, is always a never-ending story. Once we uh, solve one problem, we find that there are some other problems associated. So we, we, we are uh, very far from understanding the everything. The good news is that every day we, 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 we know much more, more things. 
And uh, I, I think that, that uh, uh, the knowledge that is, is being produced uh, by, by scientists uh, is being uh, uh, used by, 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 by the authorities. And this is a very good news. When, when the authorities can take all this information and uh, they can make uh, decisions with the, all this information, the, the decisions are much, much, much better supported. And, and, and this is a very good news. So uh, it is important that the authorities continue uh, supporting the scientific research. And also uh, it is very important to, to notice that uh, even New Zealand and Mexico, we are very far one from each other. We share many, many things. So it is important to notice that the, the collaboration among uh, uh, scientists at both sides of the Pacific, it is of uh, uh, very critical in order to uh, uh, have an enrichment on the ways and the views on how to deal with a similar phenomena. Dr. Bevington? Yeah, I'd just like to um, agree with Hugo that it's very nice to feel you're making a contribution. And yeah, through particularly the International Association of Volcanology, uh, yeah, volcanology is a very, very collaborative science internationally because everyone has problems with their volcanoes, people have solutions for some volcanoes, and yeah, feeling that you can talk to someone and say, well, that's really interesting, have you thought about that? Or, you know, I've got a problem here, and that, that speaks well to being international citizens, and it's very nice to be able to do that through one's research. Perfect. So there are a couple of more questions, but unfortunately we need to stop uh, now to the, due to the time constraints. But I'm sure we will have the, the chance to discuss among uh, these and other topics in the future. Uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Delgado, Dr. Bevington, and thank you all the audience who was very interested in this panel. And just to close my remarks, I would like to say that this international colloquium represents an excellent chance for Mexico and New Zealand to learn from each other. Uh, earlier today, uh, during the opening ceremony, uh, Ambassador Perez Bravo mentioned that Mexico has become the largest economic partner to New Zealand in Latin America. I invite then everybody here to keep working together towards the strength, towards the strength of academic cooperation among our countries, for fostering student mobility, academic exchange, as a public diplomacy strategy to elevate the friendship and mutual understandings between Mexico and New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Puea. Thank you, Nan. Thank you, Massa University. And uh, everybody have a good day. Thank you. Thank you to all of you.